Please join me in welcoming Mr. Klose as he shares with his insights on the topic of German foreign policy perspectives on Russia, Ukraine, Turkey, and the Middle East. Impact on the Transatlantic Partnership. A big, uh, it's very big. Mr. Klose, <laughs> you are here. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for this friendly introduction and thanks to all of you for coming. I he forgot something very important of uh, my biography. <clears throat> I was 1954-55 uh, an exchange school kid to the United States, and I spent a wonderful year in Clinton, Iowa, <laughs> which is right at the Mississippi River between Devonport and Dubuque, 200 My wife miles. From you are? My wife. Okay, so I say hello to her, please. Which program? Huh? Which program? American Field Service. At that, time, at that time, we came by boat, and uh, by Greyhound, and back again, Greyhound, and, and by boat. And it, it, was, it was a wonderful year, wonderful year, because in 1954, Germany didn't look like it looks today. And I came to this little town with this white house uphill and a car and television and a little boat on the Mississippi River and a swimming pool in the school and tennis lanes also. <laughs> it was really it was really something. And it has a ma has had a major influence on my on my political career, which by the way was never planned. It just happened. I joined the Social Democratic Party not to be make a career, but just to support. But uh, I was, uh, I became engaged during the times of the student revolt in Germany, because the leadership of my party was looking for somebody who could talk to the students, and they did finger pointing, the finger stopped pointing at me. So I talked to these people, we discussed the new university law, which actually was passed in the state parliament, so next time I was nominated to run for the state parliament, and uh, uh, three years later the mayor of the city resigned, and again there was a lot of finger pointing, and the finger stopped again, pointing at me. So much too young, at the age of 37, I became governing mayor of the city state of, of Hamburg, uh, which was a great time for seven years, and then I resigned in a struggle about uh, nuclear energy. Okay, I'm talking about foreign policy, and uh, I would like to, to start with making a few remarks about demography. Um, just imagine you see the map of the world in front of you, and you draw a circle around uh, China, parts of Japan, the Philippines, Korea, Indonesia, and India. And you have a whole circle. And then you realize within this circle live more people than in the whole rest of the world. I think this is a very Im important figure because it shows that uh, the world actually is changing. And uh, the world, from a Western point of view, is changing incredibly fast. The Western countries, New Zealand, Australia, Canada, the United States, and the European countries, today represent about 13% of the world's population. 13. At the end of the century, will be 7%. So we are getting into an absolute minority position, and uh, it makes a lot of sense to draw some conclusions from this situation. And the first one is, it's a very good time to go together and not go apart. Which is true for the Europeans. We should go on with the European project 
as difficult as it is. And it's also good to go along with the United States. Although the United States has taken some strategic decisions that kind of disturb the Europeans. I'm talking about pivot to Asia, which was uh, harmonized by, say, rebalancing, uh, which means that the United States discovered the demographic changes and the changes in the world economy and world trade. And uh, discovered that it was not only a, an Atlantic country, but much more a Pacific country. The United States has a long coast on the Atlantic side, but it has also a long coast on the Pacific side. And it has always been a Pacific country. And what people in, in Europe sometimes forget is that World War II for the United States at the beginning was a Pacific war, not a European war. And after the war, we had the Cold War on the Atlantic side. But on the Pacific side, there were two hot wars, Korea and Vietnam. And the United States was engaged in this one. So the United States has always been a, a, a Pacific country, too. And now, since the, the world is changing, the United States has a, a big strategic job to do. It has to balance for the next 25, 50 years, the other big superpower on the other side of the Pacific, in a manner that does not lead to conflict. Because if these two countries go into conflict, that's the end of the world. So my result is the pivot, or the rebalancing, was a necessary decision. And Obama, defining himself as the first Pacific president, actually did the right thing. He did the right thing. And we should not blame him for it. We should uh, think how we should uh, go on in our transatlantic relations. And the Europeans should think about the question, how are we going on with our European project so that we don't become just a, a little peninsula on the big huge Asian continent. That's the situation that, that we are in. Now one of my consequences is uh, since we are getting into a minority situation, we should uh, look out for partners, possible partners for the Western idea of cooperation. And I believe that uh, there are partners, and we should uh, take uh, a look at these partners and try to find out what can we do for the future to win them over. There's one thing that is rather easy. I mean, the United States would be well, well advised to uh, concentrate on Brazil. Brazil is a very important country, will play a major role in the future. It's in the South Atlantic but it's an Atlantic country. And on the other side, on the African continent, is Angola, which is also Portuguese-speaking and doing pretty good. So we could take, that's my idea, uh, reform the North Atlantic Alliance into an Atlantic Alliance. Uh, I think that the United States should take care of this. And for Brazil, it's very important to be accepted by the United States as a partner on the same level of importance. It's much more difficult on the European side, because uh, the European Union so far includes all European states, not all of them, however, because there's one state that uh, is a little bit Europe and a bigger part Asian. I'm talking about Turkey. Turkey is an Islamic state. It is a state that is far away from Western liberal standards. 
And looking at Turkey today, Mr. Erdogan and also the new Prime Minister Davutoglu, who used to be the Foreign Minister before, doesn't give you too much optimism. The only optimistic development in Turkey is the economic development. Erdogan has done a pretty good job of that one. But the interior situ situation is getting more and more difficult, and Erdogan has a tendency to uh, favor more a, a directed democracy than a liberal democracy. I'm trying to be cautious now. <laughs> uh, and uh, yes, I, I met him the first time when he was mayor of Istanbul, and I was mayor of Hamburg, so we had a chance to talk to each other. And my impression at that time was he was a very Islamist guy. And uh, until today, you have to realize there's no Islamic countries where they are building more mosques every year than Turkey. So Turkey is taking a development that from a point of view of a Western European country is difficult. However, the possibility of integrating Turkey, a Muslim country, into a dominantly Christian European project would increase the strength of the European Union considerably. So my proposal is to continue talking and dealing with Turkey, discussing solutions, discussing conflicts, uh, at least keeping the door open, keeping the door open for, for Turkey to become a member of the European Union, which might take another 10 or 20 years, I don't know. But I, I wouldn't like to smash the door. This is one of my, my big points. The other one is, uh, sounds maybe even crazier, you are smiling. I'm, I'm afraid you, you guess what, what I'm heading for. <laughs> the other one is even more crazy. The other possible partner from the point of view of the European Union is Russia. Because Russia is, of course, not a Western European country. And it's far away from uh, liberal discussions, liberal attitudes toward <laughs> culture and the science and pussy riot and uh, homo <laughs> marriage, uh, different rules in the taiga. But Russia is a European country. And the vast majority of Russians are living in the Russian part, in the European part of, of Russia. And the European culture is deeply connected with the Russian culture. I mean, could you imagine European culture without Dostoevsky, Tolstoy? Impossible. So Russia is, is a partner. It could be a partner. But it takes a long time to realize this. And I personally believe that after the time change, at the end of the Cold War, we missed some opportunities. I'll give you only one example. Yeltsin and also Medvedev, they were talking about the common house Europe, and they were both talking about a security zone from the Atlantic to Vladivostok. None of the European governments, including the European Union, has ever given any thought on this. Never. I was, just was in Brussels. I was talking to these people who were responsible for neighborhood policy, also with the Eastern European countries. None of these proposals has ever been really taken over, taken seriously. And the second thing is, I mean, we are all thinking in, in, in zones of interest. Please, you are the United States of America, and surely you have zones of interest, America to the Americas. The Monroe Doctrine was the first one, actually. 
And the Russians do have zones of interest too. And to believe it or not, Ukraine is a zone of interest of the Russians. Although Ukraine is a strange country, it, it's, it is Russian only since 1939, after the, the pact that the Nazi Germans had with Stalin. Before, Ukraine was uh, partly a Habsburg, Habsburg Empire, and it was part of Poland. And Ukraine was always divided between a Catholic Latin West and an Orthodox East. And after the breakdown of uh, the Russian Empire in 1917, there was a big civil war fought in Russia, and most of it was fought on Ukrainian soil. Nothing of this history is really known to a mess of our populations. So we are in a situation that is difficult, and it's becoming even more difficult because it's Mr. Putin. And Mr. Putin, he's small, uh, and he's very white. And when you say hello to him, he never looks at your eyes. He always looks on your chest. There was a photo of Poroshenko and, and, and Putin lately, and Poroshenko was looking at him directly, and Putin was looking at his stomach. <laughs> uh, he doesn't really dare to, to go eye to eye and, and speak loudly. He was on our Foreign Relations Committee. He was sitting right near beside me. And um, he, he gets excited, but he doesn't want to show. But there's a signal. He gets red spots behind his ears. <laughs> so, so you can see, oh, be cautious. He's a difficult man. He's a secret service man. He was educated. He was serving in, in Germany. He speaks German. And he speaks German. And he is the one who said that the biggest catastrophe of the 21st century was the breakdown of the Soviet Union. And he meant exactly this. And I believe personally that 80% of the Russians think the same way. So, yes, I believe that he is trying to kind of restore a Russian empire. He does not want to restore the Soviet Union, but he wants to restore a Russian empire. And he started doing so in Crimea. But Crimea, again, is a specific story because Crimea was always part of, uh, of Russia ever since the 17th century. It became part of Ukraine by a decision of Mr. Khrushchev, who was a Ukrainian. And he gave it to the Ukraine because he needed the votes of the Ukrainian communists to become general secretary of the Communist Party of Russia. <coughs> That's what happened. But from the point of view of the Russians, the Crimea was Russian. That does not exclude, excuse what, what Putin did. But you have to know that this is, is the fact. It's different with the Eastern Ukraine. In the Eastern Ukraine, he's following a certain uh, strategy. He wants to go to Mariupol and go up and reach Moldavia and Transnistria so that he has a connection, a land connection to the Crimea and also a land connection to Transnistria and Moldova. That's, I believe, is his, his idea. How should we react in this situation? We have to be firm. We have to be firm and say that we don't accept it. We have to continue with sanctions and sanctions are working. They're working, they hit the Russian economy. By the way, they hit the German and the Austrian and the Finnish economy also. Uh, and we have to make at least one point very clear in dealing with Russia and Mr. Putin. Yes, it's true, we don't have a military option in the case of Ukraine. But if he tries to play the same games in one of the Eastern European countries that are members of NATO, then we do have a military option. Because the principle of 
NATO is, if one country is attacked, one NATO country, that's an attack on all NATO countries. And if we don't stick to that conviction, NATO is over. So we have to transfer this message, and I'm very happy that the NATO conference in Wales did give exactly this signal. So uh, my conclusion is that we took already a military option because we decided to reallocate our plannings for Eastern Europe, which is very, very important to show that we react and another reaction must come in the future also in Germany. We'll have to at least slightly increase our spendings for defense. We right now spend about 1.3 of our GDP for security. It must not be too much when it's 1.5. It's a signal. It's a signal, and other countries and NATO countries in Europe should do the same, so that uh, also Putin gets that we are firm on this on this point. But at the same time, we should keep the diplomatic channels open, and uh, that's a good uh, time to uh, praise our chancellor because. Uh, <clears throat> The first thing, she speaks Russian. She was raised in the GDR, so she had to learn Russian. Uh, she doesn't like Putin especially, and vice versa. Uh, but uh, the Chancellor has one big uh, point in favor of her. She, is, uh, she never gets excited, especially in exciting times, which is a very good thing, a very good thing. She's very pragmatic, she's so damn normal. And uh, I think that's an advantage in, in right now. So she has to go on and, and get him on the phone and talk to him and make clear the differences. And hopefully others in the European Union stand by her side. Which brings me to my next point, how about the European Union? Well, the European Union from my point of view, it's probably the best project that we made after World War II. It was a peace project. Uh, by the way, the first one who was talking about the United States of uh, Europe was a British statesman, Churchill. In his famous Zurich speech, spoke about the United States of Europe and that Germany just imagine, I think one year after the war, Germany and France should take the lead. Uh, it is a peace project and we should stick to it. It's also a, a big economic success because I know what Europe looked like and Germany looked like in 1945 yeah. and 46. And when I look at, at Europe today, it's a miracle. It's a real miracle, by the way, the assistance of the United States, Marshall Plan, did play a, play a role. But today, we are talking for the first time, Joschka Fischer does so, <coughs> Helmut Kohl in his words, for the first time, people are discussing the possibility of failure, of failure of the European Union. And I think there are basically two problems that cause, uh, cause headaches. The first one is Europe has become an immigrant continent. And Germany right now is the second largest immigration country. But immigration comes almost 100% from Northern Africa, the Middle East, from Iran, Turkey, from Afghanistan, so it's all Muslim. And uh, people in Europe get kind of uh, uneasy looking at this development, which I, I beg you, please understand, because uh, not all Muslims we know are terrorists, but all terrorists right now are Muslims. and. Uh, especially in this situation that we have right now uh, with the Islamic State, the 
problems in Iraq and uh, in Syria, but also the uncertain situation in Libya. In uh, Tunisia, it looks a little bit better. This causes headaches. We have uh, estimation of our Secret Service about 800, no, 8,000 Salafist people in Germany. We have uh, estimated about 1,000 young males, mostly, and females, went to Syria to become part of the Islamic State. And this, some of them will come back. We have large numbers uh, from Britain going down to Syria, Iraq, from uh, France, because they have a colonial past in, in Muslim countries. <clears throat> so this is, from my point of view, one of the major reasons why we do have populist parties and rightist parties gaining additional weight. Just think of the last European elections. The strongest party in France was the party of Marine Le Pen, a real rightist party. And in Britain it was UKIP, United Kingdom Independence Party, was the strongest party in Britain. And in all other parties you also have at least populist parties, including in the meantime in Germany, an alternative for Germany, which is not comparable to Marine Le Pen's party. But um, there's a tendency all over. This is one point that at least we have to keep in, have to keep in mind. And the second problem of, uh, of the European Union is Germany. Because uh, Germany is rather successful. We are, again, the strongest economic power in, in Europe. And uh, we are living in a situation that a former Polish uh, foreign minister is cited with a statement saying he's not afraid of German tanks, he's afraid of German inactivity. Yeah. And Sikorsky. Yeah. Sikorsky. So a lot of countries in, in Europe are pressing for German leadership. But uh, if there's one thing that German politicians hate, is to take the lead. That has, of course, to do with our history. And you can, you can see it today. I mean, when Merkel is going to a country like Greece or others, you see pictures of her on the walls, and she has a, mm -hmm. a Hitler mustache. Mm -hmm. I mean, she uh, doesn't really look like Bismarck or Hitler. Uh, but that's the reaction. The reaction is that the so-called German question is back. And the German question started in 1871 when the German Reich was founded. And certainly the whole European power balance was discredited because there was one big power in the middle that the French were afraid of and the British were afraid of and the Russians were afraid of. And now there is this Germany again. Uh, and uh, again, at least uh, those who know about histories are uh, citing this uh, saying of a British statesman, Germany, too small for the world and too big for Europe. That's it. Which makes it even more difficult for us to take the lead. And then, to, to finish this point, there is this discussion with the United States about the economy, <laughs> which is a, an interesting discussion. Uh, Mr. Krugman is one of those, but he's not the only one. We are discussing about the question, how should we act in a, in a time of uh, crisis, and we obviously are in a period of crisis. Germany is not in a crisis, and I think it's important to know this, because 
during the times of a red-green government in, in Germany, Schröder was chancellor, we made a big reform project in Germany called the so-called Agenda 2010, which meant reforming labor law, social law, and so on and so on, tax law, and so on. Structural reforms that gave us a chance to go along and, and get along with the crisis. We survived the crisis because we were prepared for it. So today, Germany recommends to others, you have to go into structural reforms too. But the recipe of Mr. Krupen and others says, no, you have to spend more money, spend more money on credit. You can take more credits. <laughs> this is, uh, goes back to Mr. Keynes. But the, most of these people forget that Mr. Keynes has two parts. <laughs> One part is, in times when growth is uh, going back, you have to invest. That's fine. But in times when growth is coming again, you have to pay the credits back. And all the governments that I know, excepting the one of Bill Clinton, are following the first advice. You have to spend more money in times of crisis. But they don't follow the second one, pay back in times when there is no more crisis. And the consequence is that a lot of countries uh, try to overcome by pouring money into the market, hoping that money will create growth. Okay, it seems that the new finance minister in the United States is uh, kind of compromising because he asks Germany to invest more, which I understand, we have to find the right projects, but he also gives good advice to Italy and other countries that they should go into structural reforming. If we could agree on this one, would be a very good idea to overcome difficulties that we that we have. Let me make a, a last remark to transatlantic relations, and that's uh, NSA. Um, people in, in, in Germany for some time were kind of excited about this, angry. And I think the chancellor was angry too. She was not excited, but angry she was. Uh, yes, and of course, it is not uh, the best thing of uh, allied countries to, to spy on each other, especially trying to get control of the iPhone of, uh, of a partner, head of state. However, in the meantime, we are living in in difficult times and there is a big terrorist threat and in times of terrorist threat it makes sense to have good information. So uh, I think we should continue with our cooperation, also Secret Service cooperation. And besides this, um, we also in Germany had to learn that our own Secret Service is gathering information about other countries too. For example, about Turkey. Because all these Salafist kids that are going to the Islamic State are passing through Turkey. And we are interested to find out how they are doing this because we would like to stop it. So we are in a, in a situation to rediscover the necessity of, of cooperation. However, I must unfortunately tell you that there is a problem coming up for us and it could, be a, could become a real big problem. We have a investigation committee in the German parliament about the NSA affair. And uh, the opposition in this committee has, uh, has asked government to invite Mr. Snow to come and testify in the committee. <clears throat> the government has refused to do so for foreign policy reasons. Uh, the opposition has uh, put the case to the Constitutional Court. I don't know when they will decide, and I don't know how they are going to decide, because in front of German uh, courts and on, on the high sea, you are with God alone, and who knows what God is saying. 
But I could imagine that the Constitutional Court would say yes. The problem is, if he comes to Germany, he would probably ask for asylum immediately. And he would probably get it. At the same time, we have a treaty to the United States which enforces us to hand over people who committed crimes in the United States. And we have to follow this treaty unless this person is threatened by death penalty. If this is the case, then we don't hand it over. That's the rule. So, uh, unfortunately, I cannot uh, end this uh, little speech with a very positive news, because this could happen. This could happen, and uh, it would cause uh, additional, additional trouble. Uh, if you give me three minutes more time, I would like to make a remark about China. Um, as I said, I understand the change of strategy of the United States in going to the Pacific. I think it's necessary. I have proposed to my friends that we, the Europeans, and especially Germany, should accompany the United States on their way to China. Uh, you know, we have this famous Atlantic Bridge, Atlantic Bridge. I would like to continue the Atlantic Bridge from New York over to San Francisco, and then build a bridge, a German Pacific Bridge, to China. Why? Because I believe that the Europeans can contribute something important for the, for the Asian situation. Uh, and that's the idea of common security. Mm. Common security means that it's much better to create security with your potential enemy than against him. And when you look back at the times of the Cold War, this was the recipe of success. We were very strong and we did build up confidence. <coughs> and both measures, strength and confidence, gave us a chance to achieve what we have achieved and just celebrated a few days ago in, in Berlin. And Germany could play a part in this because the Chinese are listening to the Chancellor. She can receive the Dalai Lama in her office, then they are crazy for a week, then it's okay again. The, the Chinese are interested in Germany for one reason, not only German efficiency. No, they look at Germany and say, you have had two catastrophes in one century, two major catastrophes, and now here you are again. How did you do that? And i tell you a little story about this. One of the Beijing universities made a study on this, studied the rise and fall of states. They took Spain, Britain, Rome, and also Germany. And finally they came out and Germany was their favorite. And their favorite politician was Liszt, Friedrich Liszt, because he invented the German Union, the Customs Union, and Bismarck, of course, because Bismarck said so beautiful things like, if there are three against two, I'd rather be on the side of the three. That's very Chinese. That's very Chinese. They understand this immediately. <laughs> so it was, it was Germany their favorite. And the Chinese television made a film on this one and uh, showed it in television. And the last scene of this film, Rise and Fall of States, was Willy Brandt, Chancellor, kneeling down in Warsaw. And the comment was, the one who knelt down in Warsaw was Willy Brandt. And the one who stood up was Germany. So for the Chinese, Germany is a, a model and an example of recovery. And that's what they are looking for. That's also finger pointing against the Japanese. But it is a big point, and you can, you can work with this. And I think, actually, that we should be engaged more. And we have good reasons to do so, because we are interested in stabilizing the situation in the Pacific because our ships are passing that region too. So, uh, yes, we are, we are considering this at least. 
we are not we are not finished with it. But uh, I think we would uh, do very good uh, if we could win confidence of the Chinese. And my last word concerning the Chinese is uh, uh, a tip for literature. There is one book that the Chinese elite is reading right now, and you would be astonished when I, when I tell you what book it is. It's a book written by Alexis de Tocqueville. He wrote the book about America. But he also wrote a big book about the old regime and the revolution. The old regime and the revolution. And the idea of the Chinese leadership is that what Alexis de Tocqueville describes about the French Revolution has some similarity in China. Now, I read this book now. It's a tough, tough reading. I read it twice. I had to read it twice to understand what was going on. And I must admit there is something to it. So I recommend everybody to take this big book. It's about 500 pages, uh, a lot of footnotes and so on. But it's worthwhile because it gives you a chance to understand how the Chinese themselves see their situation. And it makes good sense in foreign policy to try to look at the world with the eyes of the others. Thank you very much. Okay, questions and answers. I'm sure we have questions. I see. I hope I phrased that right, but you said that uh, the European uh, Union should take a tough stand against Putin and his aggression. But a little bit later you said there's a question of a failure maybe of the European Union. So how do... Yeah, but in this question the European Union was close together. Yeah. And also the so-called Weimar Triangle between France, Poland, and Germany, and also the Europeans and the United States. There was no difference in this one. So we could take a tough stand, and uh, I'm hoping, of course, that the European Union will not become a failure. And this was a success story. Yeah, but take the present uh, political and economic situation among all the European states, uh, would you be able to get a... Um, Even tougher sanctions, yes. Tougher, te no, I mean militarily, a yeah. stand against. Yeah. I, I, had, I have thought about that. No, but read the protocols of the NATO conference in Wales. That was a kind of revival of NATO, actually. And uh, I think this was a real a good, successful meeting. And this was a military, military consequence. And Putin understands what, what was going on. And Putin is not crazy. I don't think he will attack a, a NATO country. I don't think so. I happen to be an East German high school student for five, six years. So the Russians made sure we love their culture. And I agree with them. And your statement was very much in kind that they are a very leading uh, European Christian Civilization and culture, not just uh, Dostoevsky, but the musicians, the lot of us up to this day, Astamak and, uh, and all these people. So, uh, is there enough knowledge in the Western European Union uh, to appreciate the Russian culture and its, its part? It's at least as big as France and Spain or Germany. <laughs> Well, I, I don't have the exact information about all member states of the European Union. I think in, in Germany, the Russian culture is very present. Well, you have this uh, arsenal of East German students, right? No, no but that's, that's not the point. Uh, we always have had close contacts to, to Russia, uh, also because there has been a lot of German immigration into Russia during the times of Katharina the Great and, and others. So uh, we know each other. And uh, actually, there's also a basis of connection that I don't appreciate so much. 
the Russians have a specific feeling about their state. It's holy Russia. And uh, the Germans sometimes had a kind of a similar relation to the state. And uh, that's, that's the part that I don't like that much. So the Russians have the feeling that the Germans are the closest to them. But I don't know whether this is a compliment. It's a possibility to use. Please. I'm, I'm curious if you know anything about this. In the early spring, there was an article in the Wall Street <coughs> Journal by someone from a think tank in Germany who was explaining Russians, the, Russia's takeover of Crimea. And the think tank author was saying, well, Russia had wanted to be part of this European, United States new free trade agreement that's underway. But instead of being kind of incorporated into that, it, they were dropped out and Georgia and Moldova were kept in. And if you look at the map of the Black Sea, that leaves Russia with one little piece of you know, connection to a warm water point. And so this author was saying, you know, Russia has commodities, we've got consumer goods. What happened to that idea? of some kind of free trade agreement that was sort of broader. Have you heard of that? Is that something that could be true as far as, far as a motivation for Putin's action? No, I didn't think so that there really was a, a, an attempt to create this kind of a free trade zone. Uh, there has been an attempt, an attempt to, uh, to get the Russians into the European framework. They were, became part of the G7 suddenly were G8, they became part of the G20. And uh, I think both the decisions were good decisions. Um, I, I think the very breaking point on the Russian side was Putin's perception of the role of the United States. Um, you know, there's this saying that Russia is, uh, is in the status of a uh, former superpower that feels humiliated. I don't think that it was the intention of the United States to humiliate the Russians, although what Obama said about Russia lately, Russia is a regional power. It's a pretty big region. Uh, what was not a real... Okay. Uh, I don't think that there was an intention to, to humiliate the Russians. But the perceptions of the Russian was they were humiliated and not treated anymore like a superpower. And a, a, super, a form of superpower that feels humiliated, humiliated is the most dangerous thing that you have. Think of Germany after World War I. It was exactly the, the situation. And uh, I personally don't believe that we'll make too much progress with the Russians as long as Putin is there. Uh, so we have to take care of those who might follow him. And there are two possibilities. There might be followers that are worse than Putin. I know one of them, Rogozin, who is the uh, vice prime minister. I have talked to him several times. He's, uh, he thinks like Putin, and he's also a firehead, which Putin is not. But there are also other developments in Russia that uh, are more hopeful. Putin, for example, in the last presidential elections did not have a majority in Moscow. So you can see in, in Moscow and in big cities, there is a tendency of catching up to the West. Not in the taiga, in the, in the plains of Siberia, but in the cities there is a change. And we have to try and, under, and, and push this development, or support this development, which is difficult. It takes a lot of single persons who know each other and go there and talk and, and so on. But I would try it at least. I would try it because I don't want to go into a new Cold War. And we are at the edge of going into a new Cold War. I don't see much sense in this one. And I think we still, still have a chance to prevent it. Uh, I hope my remarks are not the question is not uh, politically incorrect or offensive to anybody, but uh, I am a person who um, is uh, 
very, very frightened about the Islamic State. And I, I pay attention, I read, I watch, and I, I, I also read about all that is going on with the, uh, for want of a better word, kind of the political dancing between America and China and, and uh, France and Germany and uh, all, that's kind of almost like a sideshow. And yet, you see Americans spend billions of dollars in, in uh, Iraq uh, only to find a bunch of uh, Arab terrorists with a bunch of trucks and black flags walk in there and slice a bunch of necks out off the people and drag their heads around showing them. And they're like taking over an entire country or countries. Uh, maybe this is like the wrong thing to say here, but I, I want to know um, what a country that is as strong as Germany, because I perceive Germany to be the strongest country in Europe. What countries like Germany, what a country like uh, Russia, which is strong, America, we know what's going on here, China. What are these strong countries who are negotiating amongst each other? And they, what are they doing about ISIS? What What are they perceive? What how do they think it's just going to go away? Or uh, is there any consensus at all about what to do about uh, these terrorists? There seems to be a consensus, at least in, in one question. Uh, none of uh, the Western countries, U.S., Canada, others, and European, is inclined to send boots on the ground. The de explanation is, is easy. We are all democracies, and uh, there is no majority for sending boots on the ground in none of the countries, not in the United States, not in any country of, of Europe. The only boots on the ground that we have right now are the Kurdish boots on the ground. Peshmerga in, in Iraq and uh, PKK uh, on the Syrian side, which according to uh, the Turkish government is a terrorist organization. Uh, the United States took the lead in uh, <clears throat> organizing a coalition of the willing in the air. But uh, you know, airstrikes don't make too much sense if you don't have boots on the ground to define the targets. Uh, the Kurds are doing this to some extent, and our German contribution to the situation so far is we broke with one of our principles, which says never send weapons into zones of conflict. And we decided with a rather large majority in parliament to send heavy weapons to the Peshmerga and also have, in the meantime, about 160 soldiers in the Kurdish areas, but also in Germany, training these people to handle these weapons so that they have a chance to resist uh, IS. You rightly said that uh, the Russians should play a role in this, but there are some difficulties connected with it. The Russians are very close with Mr. Assad in Syria because Assad gave him a port in the Mediterranean. And so they want to maintain this, this port and go <coughs> on with it. So you could get the Russians into the deal only if we would stop to fight Mr. Assad. Well, maybe we should. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm inclined to discuss the question at least, <laughs> but, uh, uh, but I mean, we had this, we had this situation where he was uh, using chemical weapons. Uh, yeah, but uh, you have a president who drew, drew a red line. You remember? Yeah. Uh, Only one. Uh, um, I never saw the line. He said it, but there he never was any sign. Yeah, but uh, red I mean, line in the sand or whatever. It was. Uh, that makes things not easier. <laughs> Does make things easier. I think that the Russians would be inclined to help uh, because they have a population of about twenty percent Muslim in their own country, yeah. and they are interested in to kind of. Uh, getting control of that, that situation. So far, I don't see that we will, uh, that we will be very successful. Uh, and besides, you have to keep in mind that IS is so strong also because we have been fighting or have been witnessing 
kind of a religious war on the in the Middle East between Saudi Arabia and Iran. <coughs> and this brings me to the to the result that I don't see a fast solution for this problem. Actually, I'm almost as negative in my judgment as you are. I believe that this will keep us busy for the next 25 years. Well, I just came back from uh, from um, uh, Myanmar, or Burma, uh, uh, as you wish, and uh, was shocked to find out the monks, of all people, are fighting the, uh, the uh, well, Muslims yeah, yeah. in that country. It just seems like you almost can't find a country where there is not uh, yeah. a Muslim uprising or a Muslim terror. I, I hope that this, this probably sounds terrible. I'm just I mean, the, concerned the, about it. The extremists on, on the Arab side, uh, they are looking back at the old days of uh, Islam, and they want to restore this old Islam because they feel that Islamic countries fell back compared with other countries, European and others, because they did not stick to the real old belief. This is what's going on. And the more success they have, the more fighters they get. And right now they are getting fighters from all over the world, including Indonesia and even the Taliban in Pakistan have pledged for Denver school girls. Denver school girls. Cherry Creek High School. Cherry Creek High School. Yeah, we had we had girls and, and that we that we called caught in Germany at the board and sent them back. From here. Yeah. From Denver. Yes. Yeah. 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 So, I believe it is really a question of, of a long time. It's a long time. Uh, I learned a lot from Herr Close's speech tonight. I, I teach, if I were teaching a graduate seminar, I would love to have you speak. Because he, he had a card, and he had a speech outlined, and it was just brilliant. There were so many issues you brought up. And I'm going to resist talking about too many. I want to make one observation and ask one question. The observation, you started by saying you were an American Field Service exchange student in 1954. That organization, and I was involved with it too, just celebrated its 100th anniversary in Paris last week. It was called the American Field Service because these were Americans who couldn't fight in World War I from Harvard, Dartmouth, and Princeton, but wanted to make a contribution in the field driving ambulances as well. And the ambulance drivers after World War II said, Let's see if we can contribute something to international understanding now. They started a high school exchange program, and they said, we want to focus on Germany, Italy, Japan, Austria, the defeated countries, to build new relationships. And I just, I wish that organization was redefining its mission. They're not doing enough with the Middle Eastern countries. They're not doing enough <coughs> in Asia with all this growth that we're seeing. So it was a terrific program, produced people like you, but it could do even more. So. There's my observation, but give money to organizations like that. Here's my question. I, I agree with you completely on the pivot to Asia idea. I often explain, I think it's exactly the right thing for the United States, for Obama to do. Because honestly, except for politics, our relationships with Europe are excellent. On the business level, the higher education level, it's, it's I mean, in German you would say it's selbstverständlich. It's just clear why we have this kind of a, of a relationship there. But in politics, we need to do more. I agree with you. I would love to have the Germans going jointly with the Americans and developing these relationships too. My question, if you look 20 years, 25 years down the road, are you optimistic or pessimistic about how the Western world will link with China? Well, I mean, I was born in 1937, and when I look back what happened in my lifetime, there were catastrophes, but there were good ways out of the catastrophes. And uh, when I look back what happened after, after World War II from 1946 and so on, I think we made an absolutely great job all over. It was not only Germany. We made a great job to restore Europe and restore good relations and the cooperation with the United States was extremely successful because we would not have achieved reunification without the assistance of the United States. I mean, Bush father needs to be glorified for this. He was the one when 
European governments were hesitating. There were some. He said, I trust the Chancellor. That was enough. That was enough. And that helped us to, to gain unification, reunification. So it was a brilliant foreign policy and a very good relationship. And right now, probably we are we are we know each other too too good and uh, we take things for granted. Uh, there is no alternative to our cooperation. And I'm pretty sure that, uh, yes, we will continue, although I see that there is some amount of anti-Americanism in Germany, which goes along with anti-Semitism, mostly, mostly. <coughs> and we have to take care of this. And we need people who go over to the United States and, and know what the United States is, and vice versa. I'm very sorry when we cut exchange programs, and we're doing so right now. We should not cut them. We should <coughs> increase them with exchange programs with other countries. Sending people to China and so on. I think we have a good chance because I, I have a tendency to believe that our Western way is not uh, the best uh, thinkable, but it's the best that we have. And uh, I don't see any reasons why we should uh, go apart. I don't see any reason. And I'm optimistic. Yes, I'm optimistic. I'm, I'm sending my, my grandson. I was studying history in, in the United States for nine months. That's good. And uh, I would uh, support everybody, every child that wants to go over, say, hello, go over. So I, well, yeah, go ahead. I, I just read Kissinger's new book, World Order. I don't know if you've read that. No, I've never read it. Well, it's, not, it's not very good on ISIS, but uh, uh, and it doesn't give me much, actually. But I, what should U.S. foreign policy, to get the Germans to step up to take the leadership position that's good for the Western civilization, how far should U.S. foreign policy push the Germans? I don't know. What you would get you to do, what we need you to do for the good of us all. I asked the same darn question to the German ambassador to the United States when W sent us into Iraq. It's like I couldn't go, I couldn't imagine it. Where were you guys? Why would you try to stop this thing? And he said, Well, we tried. But I don't think uh, it bothers me a lot that the that we had a little that German need, needs to get over the post war period. And get on with things, okay? Everything I agree with everything you've said, okay. But it's who else is gonna do it? It's your time is now. Somebody's gotta lead Europe, okay? And uh, I don't know why that isn't in the German spirit. I think it's in the spirit of the Germans from the East, uh, but not the Germans who had Western occupiers. So I just uh, well, Sorry, I just want, I, I just bothers me a lot. Before I die, I want to see the Germans step up. <laughs> well, the, you, you know, the, the cruelties of uh, Roman Emperor Nero happened 2,000 years ago, and the world still remembers. But the cruelties of Nero was nothing against what happened in the period of 1933 to 45. This will, will always be part of our of our history and our our foreign policy. And our foreign policy is this forward policy. You probably know it. Never again, never alone. That's our, that's our foreign policy philosophy. My, my, my philosophy, though, is I watched how the Soviet Union told the Germans in the East that it was not their fault, it was the Nazis' fault. It was not the Germans' fault, it was the Nazis' fault. The Western occupiers told the Germans, it was your fault, it was your fault. So people who grew up in, in East Germany, I think are, it's easier for them to take a leader. I mean, I, I just, it's my, I've never read this anywhere, but I remember my studies on this. I just, I just, I understand what you're saying, but who else is going to do it? I know. We I, don't want to be dupes of the United States. We, we, we want a partner. 
I, I think we we have gone a pretty f long way after after the end of the Cold War. We participated without a United Nations Security Council resolution in, in Kosovo. <coughs> we were on board when after 9/11 in Afghanistan. We are still there. <coughs> uh, we did not support the Iraq War. Schroeder. The wording on both sides at that time was not too good. Uh, I think we are making progress, but you, we are democracies and you cannot order this. Become normal. Would you please become normal? No, <laughs> things don't go that way. Uh, and especially guys like me, that I'm not the right guy to ask that question because I have childlike memories of the, at least the end of the war. And uh, did I ever discuss with my parents what their feeling was during the time 33 to 45? I don't know. I don't know. My father was a prince school principal, so he was a panther. He probably was a member of the Nazi party. I don't know. He never talked about it. Can I forget that? Yeah, no. You've not mentioned Israel or Palestine in any of this. Is there a place for that issue in this discussion? Yeah, there is. A, that's a big point because we have a special relationship to Israel because, again, of our history. And uh, <clears throat> we are the ones who are uneasy because of the Israeli settlement policy, which is uh, not acceptable. But we are actually the only ones who uh, help the Israelis in their present situation of threat from coming from Iran. Because it's, Israel is a nuclear power, as you know. And uh, in case Iran becomes a nuclear power, uh, stability depends on the possibility to have a second strike capability. Iran would, as a nuclear power, always have a second strike capability because it's a big country. Israel is such a small country, it doesn't have a second strike capability because two nuclear bombs would be enough to destroy Israel. So the Germans did something that most people did not realize. We s delivered them submarines so that they can transport their nuclear possibilities and the good thing about German submarines is you can't locate them because they have a special system to run, which is extremely important for our state of Israel. So we are doing pretty good in that one. Thank you. Uh, Britain has an increasing problem with Islam, and so does France, and a certain degree Germany. Um, do you see a backlash against that? Um, I'm a little bit hesitating in answering that kind of questions because I was never a friend of uh, Huntington's idea of clash of civilizations. However, <clears throat> I see that we have at least uh, developments in this, in this direction. Uh, I would rather try to, uh, to take a strong stand against terrorism, but also try to dialogue with people of Islamic belief, because I don't think that we should go into a, a religious war. Once it gets on the level of religion, it's getting out of control. You, another hit part of our history should not be forgotten. The most uh, destructive war that took place on German soil was the Thirty Years' War, which was a war about religion, Catholic and Protestant. And it was, Germany was not even part of it, but the war was fought on German soil, and one third of the German population lost their lives in this war. Forty million versus four. Yeah, I was not referring to the governments of those countries, but to the mass, the population. Well, sometimes that can happen without the government being able to control that. 
I don't have an answer to this. I'm, I'm a little bit afraid of, uh, of the day when we have a first major terrorist attack in Germany, which we didn't have so far. We had attacks in, on other parts of the world, in Northern Africa and so on, but not like the, the Brits and uh, the Spanish. I don't know what the feeling of the population will be when it happens, when we have 300, 400, 500 people killed. Uh, it, it is extremely difficult because in the meantime, about 10% of our population is Muslim, and uh, Islam is the third largest religion in Germany. And what makes things even more difficult is religion in Germany, Catholic or Protestant, doesn't really play a major role anymore. We are getting a, becoming a more or less secular state. And the weakness of Christianity is the strength of the Islamic <coughs> people in the country. So that's, and this is something that you can influence by politics. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you.